morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ali Kane, and I'll be the moderator for our presentation. I'm part of Fleur's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, our people, are at the core of our success. As with our other Innovation Builders webinars, this will be a technical presentation. Our subject matter expert today will talk about what process safety time is and why it's important in process design. We'll talk about process safety time calculation methods, common misunderstandings, and potential methods of problem resolutions. And we'll also present real world examples from past project experience. So our subject matter expert today is Paul Garlick. Paul is a chemical engineer with 13 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. He is a chartered member of the Institute of Chemical Engineers and since graduating in 2007 has been employed as a process engineer in Fleur's Farnborough office. Paul's experience has covered a range of project design phases from process studies to site construction across many diverse process scopes from coal seam gas gathering to vacuum distillation but a, with a particular focus on upstream oil and gas gathering and processing. During his free time, Paul enjoys spending time with his 15 month year old, 15 month year old son while preventing him from destroying his house and possessions and also has an interest in automated foreign exchange trading. As is customary at Floor, we'll begin with a safety topic related to today's webinar content. Joining us for our safety topic will be Narav Chosky. Narav is a chartered engineer with over 25 years of experience in the oil and gas, nuclear and petrochemical industries, with a recent focus on the design and engineering of safety critical systems for multiple projects. He is a trained functional safety engineer and has a keen interest in the promotion of safety standards through his involvement with professional institutions such as IET and ICHEME. He has a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Instrumentation and Control from Gurjat University in India and a PhD in Process Automation from the University of Cambridge in the UK. In his spare time, he enjoys traveling, watching motorsports, and having good family fun with his kids. So, Narav, let me turn it over to you to start our safety topic for today. Thank you, Ali. Um, today's safety topic is on functional safety. Uh, what do we mean by functional safety? and what are the key issues involved in the development of functional safety systems. The need for functional safety, as is all safety issues or safety matters, is underpinned by the concept of duty of care in law, such as the health and safety executive in, in the UK or the uh, European machinery directive in the Europe, uh, which requires that the organizations must produce safe products they must provide safe working conditions and also protect the public and they also need to protect the environment all of course um, as so far as reasonably practicable the way these objectives are typically achieved um, during engineering design processes are by analyzing the so-called foreseeable hazards a hazard can be an equipment failure a human error or it could be high ambient conditions uh, and devising a mechanism to deal with such hazards. Um, a, a, a mechanism in this sense is called the safety system. Um, and when a safety system involves uh, so-called electrical, electronic, or programmable electronic systems, such as the safety instrumented system or SIS, or a basic process control system such as BPCS, then these systems are called as functional safety uh, in the parlance of the safety uh, technology. Since the safety systems are required to operate when demanded, and they need to be operate when in a, in a, in a timely manner, which is the topic of uh, today's talk, it is required that they need to be designed with appropriate reliability and integrity in mind. Uh, a study conducted in the UK Health and Safety Executive in 2003 reviewed a number of industrial accidents that resulted from the failure of control systems and this pie chart uh, shows the breakdown of typical causal factors that contributed to such accidents the study found that almost half of the uh, accidents were because of poor 
or inadequate specification, almost 44% of accidents because of poor specifications, such as insufficient hazard analysis or inadequate assessment of failure modes of the system components. The other factors as shown here are poor design and implementation practice, uh, improper change control, or inadequate maintenance and testing of system throughout the life cycle. Or in essence, the review recommends that the control system shall be assessed continuously throughout their whole lifetime, not just from the design and implementation perspective, but also from the equipment that is being controlled to make sure that they reliably perform throughout their lifetime. A number of such studies uh, and accident investigations during late 90s and early, uh, early 2000s led to development of the so-called a functional safety standard called IEC 61508, which defines an overarching framework of safety principles that must be followed in developing a, a safety protection system such as uh, ACES or a BPCS. A various industry standards like process industry, nuclear or automobile, developed their own version of standards to implement IEC 61508 within their own sectors. For process industry, for example, the standard that is relevant is IEC 61511. Uh, and for today's talk, we are going to re refer to both IEC 61508 and 61511. A key principle that applies, especially from 61508, and it cascades into other standards, is the concept of so-called safety life cycle. It is claimed that adopting a safety life cycle, such as one here, may reduce both the design and development time, as well as increase the reliability of the system. This slide shows the overall, overall life cycle as proposed in 61511. It is split into typically three phases. The first phase is called the analysis phase that starts with the analysis of hazards and results in a, in a comprehensive document called a safety requirement specification. The realization phase then implements these requirements into a number of design, engineering, and test activities. The key activities that happen during both of these phases are listed in this sticky note. And the, uh, if I can go through very quickly, the first activity is to identify the safety functions and decide what uh, the safety functions are called the so-called SIFs or safety instrumental functions and define their SIL requirement, which is the safety integrity level requirements. The second bit is the safety requirements spec, which is the SRS, to define the safety and integrity requirements of each, each of the SIFs. The third is the selection uh, of the technology and architecture of the SIFs during detailed design. The fourth bit, which is the topic of the talk today, is calculation of so-called process safety time and the response time of the SIFs to confirm that they can act in a timely manner. And the fifth activity, as shown here, is to verify that the selected design of the SAFs meet their sale levels. Um, once the, all these activities are finished, it is uh, they go through a number of tests and commissioning activities at site before they go into the final operation phase, where it is required that the system is designed, is maintained um, and tested um, throughout the lifetime to ensure the reliability of the system is, uh, is as per original requirements. Parallel to all these three phases, I uh, involve a planning cycle that documents what needs to be done, how and when, and also a verification cycle to confirm that each of these phases implements the requirements from its previous phase. The standard also requires that performing so-called uh, functional safety assessments by independent or third party to verify that the best practices and the requirements from the standard are implemented correctly by the end user as well as the designer. All in all, it is required that a holistic approach is applied throughout the life cycle to confirm that the system operates as, as it is intended to be. Uh, with that overview of functional safety, I now hand over to Paul to present today's talk on process safety time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Niraz. Hello, everyone. Um, so today's webinar is on the topic of process safety time. And uh, with me being a process engineer, I'm particularly interested in the uh, design and specification of safety instrumented systems, by which we mean our sensors and logic solvers and final elements such as emergency shutdown valves, 
that are intended to uh, protect our process against uh, upsets and, and hazardous events. So be, being a process engineer, um, you may find that um, some of the material that's presented today is biased towards a, a process engineer's perspective, but hopefully the subject matter will be of interest to everyone. Before we get stuck in, I, I just wanted to say a few words about the sort of inspiration for this topic. So um, I, I actually wrote a, a paper about two years ago uh, that was published in the Gas Processors Association uh, and it was presented at their AGM in 2019. Um, the, the topic was presented again at the uh, Hydrocarbon Processing Gas Pro webcast in 2020. And it, it really it came came out of my my sort of observation that I, I think it, when when we come to look at uh, PSVs, I, I think there's a lot of uh, well published documentation out there for pressure safety valve, pressure relief valve design and specification. So there are specific equations in API five two one and five two six, but for process safety time, there are fewer publish technical standards and guidelines on how to do calculations and so on. I, I also thought that there is generally a poorer understanding of process safety time amongst discipline engineers. And I, I would also say that there's a, a trend uh, amongst operating companies to more explicitly uh, state requirements for process safety time uh, margins and requirements in in their specifications. So that that was what really inspired the um, topic. I understand that some members of the audience may already be fairly comfortable with the uh, the subject matter today. So hopefully this will just as uh, act as a, a refresher and bring bring everyone to a, a common level of understanding. Uh, so as Ali mentioned earlier. The agenda for today is on the screen. We'll look at what process safety time is, why we should care about it. Uh, we'll look at some overview calculation methods and rules of thumb, uh, what we can do when we run into problems related to process safety time, and also look at some common misunderstandings. And where, where possible, we'll illustrate the key points with a couple of real world examples from past projects. So with, with that said, uh, I think we can dive straight in and uh, look at some official definitions. Um, so I've picked out some of the written definitions in uh, various codes and standards. So they're, they're actually all very similar. So if we pick uh, my, my personal favorite one from IEC 61508 2010 part four, uh, which I know everyone will have under their pillow, it defines process safety time as uh, the period of time between a failure that has the potential to give rise to a hazardous event occurring in the equipment under control or its control system and the time by which action has to be completed in that system to prevent a hazardous event occurring. So there is a little bit of terminology here that I, I find gets mixed up depending on who you're talking to or what document you're reading. So when they say a failure, they mean an initiating event, some, something that wasn't meant to happen that could lead to uh, a process hazard. So misoperation of a valve or instrument air failure and so on. Uh, and that has the potential to lead to a hazardous event. So I suppose uh, the most dramatic one would be uh, loss of containment. Uh, or some catastrophic failure like that. But what I find is that the, this definition as written here is, is sort of useful in a process or safety management context, but it's not really so useful for a uh, process engineer. And we, we can see why that is. I think that's best, best looked at graphically. So if we look, look here, we can see that um, we have time on the horizontal axis and we have some undesirable event occurring here. So our undesirable initiating event occurs over on the left and that causes our, our process upset and has the potential to lead to the hazardous event on the right. So the definition in, in the IEC and the other uh, codes and guidelines is as marked by the blue time 
here. So it's the total amount of time available. But the problem is, is that we, within that um, time, there may be various safeguards or independent layers of protection or independent protection layers or IPLs that are designed to uh, prevent this uh, hazardous event occurring. So for example, we could have a DCS alarm that alerts the operator that something has gone wrong and that might prompt the, the uh, operator to go out into the field and take some corrective action. So that is shown here as IPL1. So that IPL1, the independent protection layer, represents the time associated with the operator going into the field and taking corrective action, for example. However, if the operator doesn't take that action, we may end up in a situation where we end up activating our safety instrumented system and uh, instigating an automated shutdown. So we can see here that we've got the SIS safety instrumented system set point, and that triggers an next independent protection layer. So I think when we're thinking about process safety time in the context of safety instrumented system specification, clearly the only time available to our safety instrumented system is the time from when the safety instrumented system is activated to when the hazardous event occurs. And if there are safeguards that occur before that activation, well, they're not really useful for our safety system and its design. So we can see this one by one more method graphically. So if we think about our process variable, uh, so we have a process variable on the y-axis, for example, pressure and time on the horizontal axis. And we have our variable happily chugging away within its normal operating range, as shown here by the squiggly line. And then at some point, our undesirable uh, event occurs, such as uh, misoperation of a block valve, and the system becomes shut in, and the pressure deviates from its normal operating range, as shown here. So what will happen is that eventually the system pressure will re reach the, uh, uh, the safety instrumented system activation point, which is shown here as the system design condition, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And then at that point, one of two things will happen. So if we don't have a safety instrumented system or if the safety instrumented system took no action, our process would continue to deviate from its normal operating range as shown by the red line here and would eventually reach the point of catastrophe. But obviously what we're hoping is that our instrumented system does take the right corrective action and it will cause the process to settle out at some safe condition as denoted by the green line. So what we're really saying is that per our definition, the process safety time is the distance marked between point B and point D. So from the point of activation to the point of catastrophe, that is the amount of time that our safety system has available to take corrective action. And therefore the safety instrumented system response time is marked by the, uh, the distance B to C. And what we really need to do is make sure that 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 response time is shorter than the available process safety time. So as we can see on the right here, the definition that I would use of process safety time in, in an engineering context is the time from safety instrumented system activation to the point of catastrophe if the safety instrumented system took no action. So this is all very good, but um, why, why should we care about it? So, as um, Nirav mentioned earlier, something like 50% or so of control systems related uh, accidents in the process industry are related to poor specification or design of the safety system, which I, as a process engineer, I, I find ra rather upsetting. So we, we had a, a duty to ensure that our safety instrumented system response time is designed so that it responds faster than the amount of time that is available within the process uh, for it to respond. And if, if we don't do that, then we might be taking credit for 
safeguarding layers that don't actually uh, exist. And the, the thing that makes this really, uh, really tricky, and the reason that I think we need to pay special attention to it, is that process safety time calculations are, are a, a function of the process itself. So where, whereas with the safety instrumented system design, we have some freedom to pick particular sensor types or uh, final elements such as valve response times, um, there's some flexibility in that. It's much more difficult to influence the process safety time because it's a, an inherent characteristic of the process. So it depends on the process, uh, system volumes, pressures, temperatures, and flow rates, and, and so on. And so uh, it's very difficult to influence that. Uh, the, the other problems are that to do these calculations, we, we need detailed information about the process, so uh, about the uh, physical dimensions of piping and equipment and its flow rates and so on. And that information only tends to be uh, available late in, in design. Uh, and we may find that uh, we need specialist simulation tools or specialist knowledge uh, to do these calculations. So Fleur is quite lucky in that we, we have a, a knowledge online system, which is a, uh, a platform we use for contacting sub subject matter experts or finding uh, specialist knowledge. But the, the fundamental issue is that we, we only have the information needed to do these calculations relatively late in design, and therefore it creates uh, schedule and cost risk on projects. So in my experience, um, process safety time calculations are typically done sort of in the, in the run up to a 60% model review uh, around that time. And at that time, that's typically when project management are looking to sort of lock down the design and, and change control. Uh, and uh, and therefore there's there's a, a bit of a conflict about when when these calculations need to be done and the, the quality of information available. So what, what I would like to do now is just run run through the sort of key steps of a typical process safety time uh, calculation. So we're going to look at each of these steps in a little bit more detail in the following slides. But they, basically, our, our calculation workflow starts off with identifying uh, our undesirable event. So what, what is the initiating event? and uh, what is the point of failure. Uh, and then based on that, we will do a first pass calculation using some simplified method and conservative, conservative assumptions to come up with an estimate of the process safety time. And what we need to do is make, make some kind of judgment on whether that process safety time is sensible. Is it physically possible to design a safety system that can meet that available process safety time. And if we're, if we're somewhat fortunate and we've considered process safety time early on, then we'll calculate a sufficiently long process safety time and we will hand that to a, uh, a friendly technical safety uh, engineer such as Narav, and he, he will uh, take that and continue his, his work to specify the uh, safety system. If we are a little less lucky, we may find that uh, a bit more work is required, and we may have to refine that calculation to take out some of its conservatism or uh, rationalize the uh, margins or, or maybe even change the method used. And then, of course, we will go around uh, again. So we will judge whether we think that now gives us the, the right process safety time and, and we're done. And if, again, if we're a little less fortunate, then we're really facing the prospect of, of design change. So we can look at whether we can challenge the HAZOP or LOPA that raised the, uh, the initiating cause and, and point of failure, or we need to consider the prospect of design change. So what we'll do now is just discuss each of these steps in a little bit more uh, detail. So. Uh, we will start with the scenario identification. So many of us will be familiar with the idea of um, 
obtaining the initiating uh, event or cause and an undesirable consequence from a HAZOP or from a LOPA. And what we need to do is take that, undesire, uh, take that qualitative uh, assessment and turn it into quantitative numbers that we can do a calculation on. So uh, what, regardless of the, the actual sort of cause and consequence pair, the, the calculations will usually boil down to one, one of four categories that depend on pressure, temperature, level, or flow. And the identifying the point of failure or the point of catastrophe and assigning a, a sort of numerical value to it can, might not always be straight, straightforward. Um, so for example, uh, in the context of pressure, um, it's, it, there's debate uh, amongst clients and projects about where the point of failure should be defined. So on some projects, I've seen the point of failure defined as the hydro test pressure. On other projects, I, I've seen it defined as 1.1 uh, times the system uh, design pressure and so on. So th th there are no, no firm uh, rule, rules on this. and. It usually pays to uh, agree some of the, these uh, criteria up front with your client. And FLUR has a number of systems, such as the use of process bulletins to uh, disseminate information to engineering teams quite quickly and efficiently, uh, which, which really helps. Uh, as another example, in, in level, for uh, example, you might have a flare knockout drum. And it's tempting to say that on a high, high level trip, your point of failure would be the point where the liquid is, full, the drum is full to the brim. And I, th I think that the problem with that is that obviously you may experience liquid carryover with that flare knockout drum long before the drum is full. And that might lead to fire rain from the flare. Or similarly, if the drum is a compressor suction knockout drum, there may be liquid carryover into your compressor long before the uh, the drum is completely full. So the, my, my point here is to think carefully about the scenario and point of failure, as it may not always be uh, completely obvious. But in any case, once you've uh, defined your point of failure, you can now do a, a calculation around that. So in the first instance, we want to do a, uh, a sort of simplified rendition of the calculation. So we're we're trying to identify usually the worst case flows in and out of a system and the worst case starting conditions. And we want to apply simplifying assumptions that allow us to turn that calculation into almost like a time step calculation, something that can hopefully be done in a, in a spreadsheet. And uh, in, what I usually find is that uh, we need to apply generous margins to our process safety time calculation. And that is to reflect the sort of level of uncertainty in the calculation due to the initial assumptions used, and also uh, reflects the aging of the system. So our, our safety system, when it's first uh, designed and, and fabricated and tested in the factory, may have a certain response time but they, that may get uh, longer through the uh, safety system's life. And so we have to be prepared to apply generous margins to our, our process safety time calculation. Or conversely, we, we require that the safety instrumented system responds in half of the available process safety time. And sometimes that can be really difficult to achieve. So uh, I, I think it's useful if, uh, process engineers and the people doing these calculations have some way of estimating whether a process safety time calculation gives them a sensible answer or not. So we can do that by, by estimating what our safety instrumented system response time is. So we uh, work that out by summing these three components. The uh, safety instrumented system response time is the sensor detection time the log plus the logic solver time plus the final element action time. So many of us might be uh, familiar with the idea on final elements of uh, allowing, say, one, one second per inch of valve body. 
And usually if you've got like a, a, a pressure trip, for example, the, the valve closure time or activation time is usually very long compared to the sensor detection time and the logic solver time. So those terms tend to get ignored. But if you look carefully at the, the table, for example, under temperature measurement, we can see that for thermal wells, the uh, response time can be as long as 40 seconds, uh, which obviously leads to potentially a very long system response time. And when we need to apply 100% margin to that, we can see that we need a very long process safety time indeed. And actually, uh, we, we had a, an example of this uh, on a uh, previous project. So we had an oil rundown line uh, as shown here. And so we, we were cool, cooling uh, export oil in a rundown line to the on-spec uh, tank. And the particular concern here was uh, failure of the export oil cooler fans. And so we had some valves uh, and a high temperature trip where the intention was that the high temperature trip would switch the uh, valves and redirect material to an off-spec tank. So in this system, all of the uh, on-spec, uh, so there, there we go, so all of the on-spec uh, piping and the off-spec piping in the off-spec tank was designed for high uh, temperature but the on-spec tank was not. So the idea is that when, when the temperature transmitter detects high temperature, it switches the valve's positions and redirects the hot oil flow to the off-spec tank. And obviously it needs to do that before the hot oil reaches the on-spec tank. And the, the problem here was that the, the uh, temperature sensor time was very long and the calculation was done relatively late in design, uh, but actually here we, we ended we ended up being, being okay. The, uh, the, um, the distance to the on-spec tank was approximately 280 meters and the oil velocity was about four meters a second. So we, we calculated a 70 second process safety time and it just about uh, accommodated the sensor time and the valve activation time with the uh, required margin. So this calculation is, is a, or this scenario is a good example of two things. One, one is that it's a, a nice example of a calculation that can be stripped down into something very, very simple. So we treated the hot oil flow as simply a plug flow of hot oil, didn't worry about heat up of the metal piping and, and heat loss and so on, and is therefore a calculation that could, could conceivably have been done uh, even as a preliminary calc fairly early on. Uh, I would also say it's a good example of a calculation or a scenario where early consideration of, the, uh, of process safety time might have led us to improve the design perhaps by um, moving the temperature transmitter closer to the export oil cooler. And that would allow us to detect the high temperature much sooner. And that would obviously help us when it comes to doing our process safety time calculations. So here, here we were okay, um, but inevitably, if you do enough uh, process safety time calculations, you will then eventually end up uh, doing a calculation where you you don't calculate a sufficiently long process safety time. And when that happens, you need to uh, look at refining the calculation. So there are a number of uh, ways to, to do this, but all of them uh, sort of revolve around these three methods. So uh, rationalizing any conservatism or margin that we've built into the calculation, uh, replacing any assumptions with, with real data if we have it, and it may be looking at alternative or more rigorous um, calculation methods or tools. So on uh, the next slide, we have a, a table that looks at these in a little bit more detail. Um, the, these are actually available in, in the published paper 
for anyone who wishes to review them in more detail. I was just going to pick out a couple here. So, for example, we can pick out um, system volume and control valves. So these are examples of ways in which we might make a calculation more rigorous. So on the left, we can see a simplified method where we might use estimates of line lengths from our plot plans and build margins into that as a first pass process safety time calculation. And if we find that that isn't giving us a, a nice answer, we can use actual piping lengths from isometrics or 3D piping models if they're available. And similarly, for a control valve, we might use a crude estimate of the CV, uh, the control valve CV initially. And later on, we might be able to use a vendor provided CV, which will hopefully lead to a better answer. Um, the, the, other, um, the other one that I, I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail was, was heat transfer. So heat transfer can be quite quite tricky to model in, uh, in process safety time calculations. And uh, there's various points made here that can be applied to uh, make a calculation more rigorous. But rather than look at them here as such, I, I think these are best illustrated by way of an example. So we have an example of a uh, high, high temperature trip from a previous project. So the scenario considered here is uh, actually a uh, ga gas compressor, sour gas compressor, that was uh, the particular scenario concerned, concerned with this was uh, startup. So during startup of this compressor, uh, it would be operated uh, using fuel gas uh, on recycle. So the fuel gas would go around through, through the air cooler. And the, the concern was that the air cooler might fail during startup, and that would lead to warm gas going to the compressor suction, which would then lead to very hot gas at the compressor discharge and potentially exceeding the piping design temperature, which might lead to loss of containment or overstress and, and so on. So three, um, three renditions of this calculation were done to try and uh, meet the uh, required process safety time. So in our first uh, pass of the calculation, uh, we only really looked at the, the process fluid temperature and assumed a simple plug flow of the high, high temperature fluid through the system. And this uh, unsurprisingly showed that the process safety time was very, very short and, and not reasonable. And so we had to refine the calculation where we looked at a uh, lump heat transfer analysis in a second rendition of the calc. And we looked at the heat up of the, the metal rather than the temperature of the, the process fluid itself. And unfortunately, this still didn't give us the uh, process safety time duration that we needed. So we were faced with having to refine the calculation further still. So in our third rendition of this calculation, uh, we ended up building a rigorous model in HISIS dynamics mode, incorporating uh, vendor data regarding the, the compressor and the anti-surge valve characteristics and uh, real line lengths and, and thicknesses and so on. And we, we were also lucky enough to uh, have a, a former Aspen Tech employee uh, on the project team uh, for that one. So, so uh, yeah, have, having the, the right knowledge and, and the right skills is, is really, really beneficial. And this third rendition of the calculation did uh, prove that we had sufficient uh, process safety time, which allowed the, uh, the TRIP system to, uh, to be uh, designed and, and the design to progress. So th this is an, uh, an example of where, you know, th this was all done as desktop exercises. And uh, it's, it's always nice when process safety time calculations can be done using paperwork. But once again, if, if you do enough process safety time calculations, you, you may find your, yourself in the uh, unenviable situation where you, you've exhausted all options for removing margins, using real data, and uh, using the, the best simulation tools. 
And at that point, you still can't uh, achieve the process safety time. And when that happens, you're, you're really faced with the prospect of design uh, changes. So as we mentioned earlier, we're normally doing these uh, calculations fairly late in design when there's sufficient definition of, of sort of the, the process physical layout and geometry. And that means that uh, when when we do have problems, it, it's usually quite quite serious. Um, I, I find that uh, when, when you're in this situation, close collaboration between uh, your discipline engineers, uh, good, good teamwork and a bit of experience is very helpful uh, to find the most pragmatic uh, path forward. And I, I've listed some of the options here for process safety time resolution. And I, I've, I've tried to list them in the order of, of what I feel is least drastic to sort of most drastic. Um, and we can uh, see these here. And the, I, I think obviously the, the sort of order of preference of this list would de depend on the, the particular project or scope that you're on and the key drivers for that, that project. Um, and if, if you find yourself in this situation, I, I unfortunately have seen uh, projects in the past where um, you know, fundamental changes in the type of uh, over over pressure protection or safe safeguarding measures are, are required. So, before wrapping up, I, I just wanted to uh, look at a couple of uh, sort of common misunderstandings that I've come across in in process safety time before. Uh, so, the first example. Um, concerns the situation where you have a safety instrumented system, so the uh, on-off valve shown in blue there, in, a, in series with a uh, pressure relief valve as shown in red. And in this particular um, particular scope, the uh, scenario of concern was closure of that manual valve on the, the right, the upper valve, which would lift the system to be shut in which could result in uh, overpressure if you have gas coming from a high pressure source. So in this situation, it's tempting to say that um, if our safety instrumented system activates, the time that it takes to close is not too important because any excess material will be relieved from the system by the pressure relief valve. And uh, I, that's a, a a bad basis to choose because we, we need our protection layers to be independent layers of protection. So they have to act as a safeguard in their own right. So when we're doing our process safety time calculation, we, we can't take any credit for the pressure relief valve do, doing its job. So that's the uh, the first thing to look out for. The, the other one that I thought was uh, worthy of mention was to uh, carefully consider our system volume and extents when setting up our calculation. So um, here, here's another one I, I've seen on a previous project where you have a, a very large gathering system coming from high pressure sources and it goes into a, a process with a, um, uh, a safety instrumented uh, shutdown valve to trip on high pressure, and we have a valve such as a valve shown at X, which can be closed and that which uh, shut the system in, and we have a relatively small volume between the safety instrumented system uh, and that manual valve. So when we're doing our process safety time calculation, we we, we might be led to believe that, that we're doomed because the system volume is so small. Uh, downstream of, of the emergency shutdown valves and that we will never calculate a sufficiently long process safety time. But I, I think that would be a, uh, uh, a bad assumption because actually when that, that valve at X is closed, all of the system upstream will pack and therefore all of it will contribute to the process safety time. We might not be in as much trouble as uh, maybe we first suspected. So. Uh, Again, the message here is just to, to carefully consider the extents of our um, system when setting up your uh, when setting up our calculations. So, with that said, I think I can uh, wrap up here. So, 
in conclusion, uh, I think the, the main points were that you know process safety time is uh, critical for confirming that the safeguards that we build into our design actually do the job that they're intended to do, that our safety instrumented systems will react and render the process safe before the process reaches a, a point of catastrophe. And our, our calculations are usually done late, late in design. They can be quite, quite challenging and require specialist tools. So we should be thinking about process safety uh, time and our safeguarding methods sufficiently early in, in design to prevent upsets later on. And uh, we just need to make, make sure we're using the, the right tools and, and methods for the job. And I, I would say that there is a, a trend in the industry uh, towards sort of more explicitly stating requirements for process safety time calculations, uh, margins that are applied to them and so on in uh, in our client specifications, which I, I think is a is a good thing, uh, so that we can ensure that our, our safeguards really work as intended. So, I think that's everything that I, I wanted to say on the topic. So, uh, at this point, I'll I'll hand back to uh, Ali, in case there are any questions. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Narav. Um, great topic today. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so the first one I want to start with is, um, should process safety time have a role to play in the selection of instruments or in the selection of our alarm and trip set points? Um, yeah, so yeah, yes, I, I think that process safety time does uh, play a role in uh, setting the alarm and trip set points. So I, I think initially in design, we, we tend to specify the alarm and trip set points where, where we want them, uh, as in at particular values that provide us margin above our maximum operating, normal operating condition or uh, sufficiently below the system design condition. But when we come to do process safety time calculations, we, we may find that we're we're out by a, a, a small amount and that a small adjustment to the uh, trip set point would uh, give, give us the um, calculation time that we want. So, yeah, yes, I, 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 on, on previous projects, I have seen uh, SIS set points adjusted to better accommodate uh, process safety time. Great, thank you, Paul. Got another one for you, Paul. Um, so is there any advice on how to define the point at which hazardous events occur for the temperature variable? So um, for pressure, you mentioned there are some generally accepted margins above the design pressure before you get to the hazardous event like a rupture, but um, this isn't readily available for temperature. So um, the question that was asked is, for example, is it one degree Celsius above um, DT, or is there some other guideline? So, uh, in in my experience, the um, the temperature has all the point of failure temperature has always been specified as the uh, design temperature, and I, I don't recall any instances where I've seen that uh, done any other way. Not that's not to say that it is not possible to do it any other way, but I've always seen it as the um, the design temperature, and we we tend to buy more time by considering the warm up of the metal rather than looking at just the temperature of the the fluid itself. Not not sure whether that that answers the question. Um, hopefully so, but certainly um the individual who who asked this, if you have more, we are happy to answer it. So um. We'll move on to the next question. Um, so you mentioned, Paul, in the presentation that conservatism could be reduced. And prior to that, um, said often the 100% margin would be added to a calculation. So what are the reasons for such levels of margin um, is one question. And secondly, what guidance is there on when or how the conservatism can be reduced? 
Um, so in, ter in terms of why the margin is there, I, th I think we may mentioned that earlier in the presentation. So it it's, it's there to uh, accommodate the sort of un uncertainty and the margins that are applied to your calculation and its uh, methods, and also to take into consideration the, the aging of the safety system and it may get slower uh, as it ages. And in terms of the, the margin uh, required, so I, I've always seen 100% mar margin written into uh, client specifications or, or is always used as, as sort of your baseline level of margin. And in terms of where when and when it can be relaxed, I, I think that that basically requires uh, a bit of professional judgment or engineering judgment and uh, agreement with you know pro project counterparts. Uh, so, for for example, if a particular calculation uh, uses information which is sort of fairly clear cut and, and difficult to challenge. Uh, such as, for example, um, uh, the uh, oil rundown line uh, example that we were looking at earlier. The, the calculation essentially uses the, the liquid flow rate or velocity and the line length from the uh, trip uh, detection point to the uh, on-spec tank. And and those values will be known pro probably with good good detail. The the error associated with them is quite small. So th this would be a candidate where the the hundred percent margin re requirement uh, can can be relaxed. And, and again, I've I've uh, seen projects where where it is, where that margin has been relaxed, but um, you know it. It's really on a on a case by case uh, basis, and obviously in the example of the compressor, where the there's a lot more uncertainty, we, we would be less willing to re relax the margin requirement. Great, thanks, Paul. All right, um, so I think you may. Um, this is another question that came in. Um, so, are there any standards which define that? Um, SIF response time to process safety time ratio, or is it generally defined by client sp specification or left to EPC judgment? So I, I, I would say that um, in, in my experience, uh, I, I've seen it written into client specifications and where it is not written into client specifications, usually a 100% margin is is applied anyway as as good practice. I, I, I'm not sure whether N Narav would have uh, anything to add to to this regarding specific clauses in the uh, IECs and similar. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, I think uh, IEC um, doesn't actually go into detail on uh, any 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 kind of ratio. It says it has to have the SIF response time or the response time of the SIF should be less than process safety time. Um, and as you said, it is mostly the client spec that defines. And uh, in most cases, uh, clients tend to offer a hundred percent margin as a starting point, and then where. Um, you are uh, a, a tricky situation where it is not possible to reduce process safety time or increase process safety time, sorry, um, then uh, to revisit the safe response time and the margin could be reduced on a case by case basis on the basis of uh, considering other factors such as accuracy and uncertainty in the actual final design. So and I think there is no, there is no uh, formal guidance given in, a, in the standards that, uh, that I know of. Thanks, Narav. Thanks, Paul. All right, another one. Um, this this individual has a structural engineering background in oil and gas facilities, and um, so he says, as we know, structures and foundations are usually well uh, progressed by the time the process conditions are defined, and that always has cost and schedule impact. So, um, Paul and Arav, how would you recommend that we better identify the requirements earlier in the project schedule? 
Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, everyone loves uh, when process engineers change things. So uh, <laughs> we we normally get uh, a little bit of uh, stick for this, but I I think with um, process safety time, um, it it really comes down to sort of awareness and and experience. So. You know, I, I personally believe that, you know, in conceptual design, the responsible engineers or process engineers should be thinking about their their sort of preferred methods or the, or the required methods of over pressure or over temperature protection. Uh, and, and, you know, trying trying to avoid situations based on experience where Process safety time issues might might become an issue late later on, and if there are particular um, areas of the design where a very sort of quick high level calculation can be done very very early to just flag what order of magnitude process safety time we're going to encounter, and is it likely to be a problem? Then we we get that heads up. Uh, early on, so that we can be thinking about it and keep a watch on it through through the design, to hopefully avoid um, our structural uh, co colleagues uh, facing cha changes due to you know changes in line sizes or classes or or whatever late, later on in design. So, yeah, I, I think you know other than being very aware of it and thinking carefully about safeguarding earlier on, I think they're they're our best defenses against this. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. Um, so this is going to be our last question today. Um, so um, Shruti, if you navigate back to example two, um, the question is, were there any considerations given to tripping the compressor on the air cooler cooler failure rather than waiting for the measured temperature to be the initiator? particularly as the air cooler is part of the anti-surge loop. So uh, that, that particular question uh, involves a, a detail of the design uh, with which I, I'm not personally familiar. So I, I, I think if it's okay, Ali, we, we would need to maybe take, take that one off, offline to allow me to, to follow up. Sure, absolutely. We can definitely do that. And what we'll do is um, we'll be able to send uh, a response in the recap email. Okay, yeah, that, that's good. Perfect. All right. Um, well, I think this is, we're getting to the top of the hour here. So that was going to be our last question. Um, so I just wanted to say to our audience, thank you for joining us today. And um, please continue to stay informed of our Innovation Builder events by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or following our social media channels using hashtag Innovation Builders. If you'd like to send us, uh, like us to send you email notifications of future webinars, please email us at innovationbuilders at floor.com with the opt in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you for dialing in today. Like I said, we'll send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days, and you can expect to see the webinar recording available on demand um, mid next week at floor.com. Again, any questions, um, you can reach out to innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. So from all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Mm -hmm.